All right, great. Okay, so this chapter is just going to be probably today's lecture, and that's it. And then we'll get into moment method next, and integral equations in the next lecture. Hopefully, we'll see. All right. So in order to study the uh, spherical cavities that we're going to study, we need to understand how we construct the T e to R and T m to R wave functions. And those wave functions are obtained by solving the wave equation. But as you remember, when we tried to separate the wave equation and cylindrical coordinate system last semester, we ran into the problem that uh, all three of the of the field components were coupled to all three of the equations. So there was no uncoupled equations. And then we had to still solve the set of three scalar PDEs simultaneously together. And we, we said that that's probably too difficult. And we chose to do another route, which was to derive a wave equation in terms of potentials rather than uh, in the field components directly as we did for the cylindrical and the rectangular coordinate system. So here we're gonna revisit that approach because we need some, um, some uh, formulas that we derive from that, and uh, we'll then move on to solving the cavity problems, okay? So although we have studied vector potentials in detail last semester in the previous course, we're gonna revisit them here. I know we did this slide last time, but let's just start again here. So the purpose of understanding how TE to R and TM to R modes are constructed in spherical coordinates. All right, so we want, our goal is to construct modes which are TE to R and TM to R. So that means any solution that we have that we uh, use these wave functions for have to have this characteristic, T e to R and T m to R, right? Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take this auxiliary path or this alternate path. We're going to derive an A for the vector potential A, ma magnetic vector potential A and electric vector potential F. We're going to derive formulas linking those to the sources J and M, which are inputs to the problem. And we're going to calculate the radiated E and H fields directly from the potentials. So rather than calculating the fields directly from the sources, we're going to calculate an intermediary quantity called the potentials from the sources, and then we'll obtain the fields from the potentials through a differentiation operation, which is common when you link uh, force fields to potentials. It's in general a, a derivative, the differential relation. All right? Okay. So that's the strategy. Uh, as you know, we're going to define the magnetic vector potential in terms of its curl and its divergence. When we specify both of those quantities, that vector field is uniquely defined. And, and also there has to be a property that it decays as one over R as, as the R goes to infinity and so forth to remove the surface integral part. But uh, anyway, B is equal to the curl of A. That is our definition for the curl of our magnetic vector potential. All right, we have to make sure that this definition satisfies Maxwell's equations, all four of them, because we're gonna use it as an apparatus to solve for the electric and magnetic fields, which must satisfy Maxwell's equations in terms of the sources, J and M. So the reason, uh, I guess one of the motivating factors of why we chose B to be the curl of A is because the divergence of B has to be equal to zero. Therefore, if we take the divergence of the curl of any vector, that equals to zero. So immediately we satisfy magnetic Gauss law, right? With this definition. All right, now let's check Faraday's law. So we have the curl of E is minus J omega mu H. We know what H is, it's one over mu curl of A. So we substitute that in here. And the curl is a distributive operator. So we can move both the curl terms to the left-hand side. And we get the curl of E plus J omega A is equal to zero. All right, well, we know that if a vector field, even if it's constructed from the summation of two other vector fields, this is a vector field itself, has no curl, then it's a conservative vector field. It obeys the independence of path and so forth. So, uh, Another, con another way to describe a conservative vector field is that it's the gradient of some scalar field. All right, so immediately when we see a result like this, we can say, oh, well, e, to the j omega, e plus j omega a can be related to the gradient of a scalar field. All right, why? Because the curl of any gradient is equal to zero. And here we choose a negative gradient. Why do we choose the negative gradient? The identity still holds in that case. We choose the negative gradient because this is a result that we're familiar with from statics, right? And this entire result goes to the static case when omega equals to zero. That's what statics is, no time variation. That means E equals the negative gradient of phi, uh, and phi is the, stand, is the usual scalar electric field. No, scalar electric potential, right? So now we have an electric field in terms of its potentials that also applies to the dynamic case. 
right? When there's time varying sources. All right, good. So that's, that's one thing here, right? So this is a differentiation path, meaning that we obtain the field E from a derivative of the potentials, right? Here it is. E is retained in terms of derivatives, gradient is derivative, spatial derivative. And then J omega A is what kind of derivative? Time derivative in time harmonics, right? So it's in terms of its derivatives. E is in terms of the derivatives of the potentials phi and A, right? And we'll relate phi to A when we apply the Lorentz gauge. Okay, so now let's check Ampere's law. Curl of H is J omega E plus J. We know what H is, it's one over mu curl of A. And we know what E is, it's minus gradient of phi minus J omega A. All right, well you can rearrange this equation to obtain a wave equation or something similar to a wave equation, uh, or almost a wave equation uh, in this red equation here, right? So this equation, if you satisfy this equation, then you satisfy Ampere's law using the potential framework. All right, good. This would be a wave equation if this term wasn't there, right? And I guess we can use the expansion of the curl of the curl of A in terms of the Laplacian and the gradient to the divergence in order to define the divergence such that it cancels that additional term that we have. And that's what we're going to do. So we define the divergence of A as minus J omega mu epsilon phi because we are free to choose the divergence still. We've fixed the, the curl of the vector field A, and now we're going to fix the, or choose the, the divergence of the vector field A. Now it's uniquely defined, right? And using this, this uh, choice called the Lorenz gauge, we can convert this expression now up here into this one, which is a wave equation. So now we've succeeded in solving or relating A, J to A. We already related E to A, and now this equation here allows us to calculate A in terms of J. It's a differential equation, we have to solve it, but we're used to solving this type of differential equation by now. All right? Okay, good. So having defined the Lorentz gauge, we can also go back to our definition of E in terms of the gradient of phi, and we can rewrite that fully in terms of A, and we end up with this expression. So E in terms of A, and then A in terms of J where J A is acting like this intermediary quantity where we calculate A from the sources given to the input to the problem, and we calculate E from that A, right? So now we're reduced to solving this wave equation, which is uh, easier to solve. This is an inhomogeneous wave equation, right? So that's, that's the key to this. It, in, it involves sources. So we can take a source, and now we can calculate E due to that source, right? By solving a wave equation with a, the linear right-hand side, I guess more than linear, right? It's just a constant multiplied by the current density. All right. So now we got to derive a wave equation for the spherical coordinates. We go back to this expression, right? And instead of applying the Lorentz gauge, we're going to do something a little different. We don't want to obtain an inhomogeneous PDE at the end because we're not trying to solve for radiation due to sources. There are no inputs. What we want to do is derive a wave equation that allows us to obtain eigenmodes, eigenfunctions, allowable solutions to the coordinate system and that satisfy Maxwell's equations that we can express other solutions in terms of, right? Okay, so we start with this expression that we had, and in a source-free region, we still have the curl of the curl of A minus omega squared mu epsilon A, but J is zero, right? So now we have minus J omega mu epsilon gradient to phi. Very good, and this is useful when uh, electric sources are present, right? Okay, so I say electric sources are present, but, uh, and then we said it's a source-free region, right? But what we're talking about is here is when we need to solve problems that involve J, because then we'd use the magnetic vector potential A. A relates to J, and F relates to N, right? Okay, a similar expression can be found starting from this definition of the electric vector potential, which is related to M, so from, from uh, J, we go to A, then we go to E or H, right? But if we start with M, then we go to F, then we calculate E and H. If we have both J and M, then there's a contribution to E due to A and a contribution to E due to F. So you have to consider them both, all right? So you get a similar equation here. 
this is useful for when you have m's, right? All right, so we still have this gradient of phi and gradient of phi m, which is the magnetic scalar potential. So to derive T e to R modes, we may assume an electric vector potential, an electric vector potential in the R direction, as we normally do, right? If we want T e to R, we choose an electric vector potential that has an R component only. Why? Because if we have an F with only an R, then we calculate E by taking the curl of that F, and the curl of a vector field is orthogonal to that vector field, especially if it has, you know, one. Why? Because if you have an axis, right, and we're calculating the curl, what we're calculating is the rotation of that vector field around some given axis, right? Now, if that axis is the R direction, the vector field which rotates about R necessarily is orthogonal to that axis, right? Okay, good. So you can calculate E due to the F portion as one over epsilon curl of F. And, okay, so this F only has an R component, right? So E cannot have an R component. So you can look at the full expansion of the, vec of the uh, curl of a vector field and spherical coordinates, and you can convince yourself even further that this electric field will not have an R component. So let's go to this curl of A. What is the R component? The R component is dependent on A phi and a theta but there is no phi and there is no theta there's only a r there should be f right but this is just the definition of the curl in terms of a general vector field a all right so that term goes away if you have an r component then this term is there so you have a theta and this term is there and you have a phi right which is orthogonal to r okay so we're going to derive a wave equation for the te to r spherical waves we start with our wave equation here that we've derived or differential equation, and we start to expand things. We know that there's only an R component, so let's calculate this term first, yeah? All right, to do that, we know that F only has an R component. We're taking the curl of that. If we go back to the previous slide, that means that uh, we might have a theta component, we might have a phi component, and it will be partial AR with respect to phi and partial AR with respect to theta. So here are those two terms, the theta and the phi term, and we differentiate with respect to phi and theta, all right? Now, that's just one curl. We have to take the curl of that result, so we get the curl of the curl of f. So now we apply that definition, and uh, this is it expanded out, right? So now we pick up an r component, because we're taking the curl of a theta and a phi, not just the r. So we have an r component, we have a theta component, and a phi component. Very good. So that takes care of this term. Let's take a look at this term now. We need the gradient and spherical coordinates as well. So all we're doing, big picture, before we dig into the math and get lost, is we're trying to express this in spherical coordinates. This is independent of coordinate system at the moment, right? This is all vector calculus in terms of curl operations and gradients. But we're now specializing this to the spherical coordinate system. That's all we're doing. So we had to express the curl of the curl of f in spherical coordinates. Now we're going to express the gradient to phi in spherical coordinates, and we obtain the following expression, which is well-known for spherical coordinates. All right. Now, this is an equality, right? What does that mean with vector equations? Theta is equal to thetas. Phi is equal to phi, r is equal to r's, right? So we do component by component, and we end up first matching up the r components through the equality. We get uh, this expression. So this is for the R component, yeah? For the theta component, you get this expression. For the phi component, you get this expression. Very good. All three of these have to be satisfied, right? In order to satisfy the original wave equation, which comes from Maxwell's equations. So all three of these have to be solved simultaneously. One way to do that is if you define partial FR with respect to R, right? So look at this equation. We have the derivative of f with respect to theta, the derivative of f with respect to phi, and we have the derivative of phi with respect to r, and then the derivative of f with respect to r. Okay, so, uh, so what we're saying here is, these two we can take care of immediately if we define this derivative. Why can we define that derivative independently, right? Partial f with respect to r, Uh, so we're trying to construct what this F has to be, 
to give us a solution that gives us T e to R, right? So before we just said that uh, we have an F and we surmised what its form should be when it is applied to certain geometries like cylindrical waveguides or rectangular waveguides, right? But here, we're trying to start from Maxwell's equations and construct a vector potential F and all of its requirements in order to satisfy the wave equation for T e to R, right? So this is one requirement, right? We have to have the derivative of F, R, with respect to R, equal to minus j omega mu epsilon phi m, all right? If we make this equality, then we can define phi m in this way, and that means that partial by partial theta is here, but then this partial by partial r of f of r, this term becomes this, right? All right, good. Okay, good, good. So now uh, we have these two terms, right? So now we've, now we've uh, recast it into these two equations. All right. Okay, let's see what the consequences of that are. So the last two expressions are satisfied if we define uh, phi m in this way, which is what we have here, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. All right. These two equalities are satisfied. So we will substitute the expression into the remaining, into the R components, right? So here's the R component. We know what phi is now. We have to use that phi in the R component. So this term becomes this, all right? And if you do that, and you work out what this derivative will be, I mean, this will cancel that, and the negatives cancel, you get the second derivative of F. <coughs> Jeez. The second derivative of fr with respect to r squared, partial. Okay, good. And we still have all of these terms out front, yeah? If you look at these terms out front, what you'll find is that... Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is move this term to the other side of the equal sign. And if you work out these derivatives... Uh, oh, no, this is just listing the rest of it, right? All I did from this line to here is to move the second derivative to the left-hand side. <clears throat> now, uh, I think I do it on the next slide. No, I don't. Okay. This whole thing, if you if you look at it closely, becomes the uh, Laplacian in, cylinder, or in spherical coordinates. This, this is the expansion of the Laplacian in spherical coordinates, not of f of r, but of f of r divided by r. That's one key conclusion to this, right? We derived a wave equation now. It's a homogeneous equation, which is good because we wanted to solve for eigenmodes. We didn't want to solve for driven problems or sources on the right-hand side. And it is, but is it in term of, it's in terms of fr over r, right? Okay, del squared plus beta squared fr over r equals to zero. So this is our wave equation and spherical coordinates that we must solve. We solved this last semester. We're not going to go into the details of how to solve it, all right? You solve it by separation of variables. What you obtain in the radial direction are spherical Bessel functions and spherical Hankel functions. What you obtain in the uh, polar direction, in the theta direction, are Legendre polynomials, in particular associated Legendre polynomials. And in the azimuthal direction or phi direction, we had obtained uh, e to the j m phi's, right? Harmonic functions. Okay, be sure you guys remember those. All right, so if we solve this wave equation, then we obtain uh, F, right? And once we have F, we can find E, we can find uh, H from here. Okay, that's the strategy. All right, good. And you can do the same thing for TM to R modes, except here you use a, a, a magnetic vector potential rather than an electric vector potential. You arrive at the same differential equation, but now it's in terms of AR over R rather than FR over R. You can calculate E and H directly from A. All right? In the end, for either mode, we have to solve this. This is called the scalar Helmholtz wave equation. We solved this last semester. And you can set psi equal to these variables, FR over R, AR over R. And you can solve this easily using separation of variables. All right? OK. Good. So once you solve that, though, you obtain uh, a solution for FR over R technically, right? But what we need is FR. 
So if a solution, if psi equals a separable solution, f, g, and h, is a solution to the scalar Helmholtz wave equation, del squared plus beta squared psi equal to zero, then r psi, r times psi, is a solution to the differential equation we derived, right? Okay, good. So what does that mean for our functions that we derived? We derived f of r, for example, from solving this wave equation, right? All right, deriving the fr for this was for actually the psi. Where is it, psi? Here. So in order to obtain fr, we have to multiply those solutions by r, right? So before we derived the spherical Bessel functions or the spherical Hankel functions that were lowercase letters, bn, right? b in general, where b could be either j, y, h, 1, or h2, right? But because in the spherical coordinate system, we need the solutions which are r multiplied by psi, then we give those a capital B, capital letter, and we put a hat on top. The capital hat just means that we scale this solution by r. So the capital Bn is the solution to this wave equation, the one we need, right? Those are equal to the solutions to this wave equation, but multiplied by r. We add the beta as well because the argument has beta r, right? And those, we just multiply beta r by the definition of the spherical Bessel functions or spherical Hankel functions. And if you do the multiplication, they are this, right? Where B could be JY, H1, or H2. All right. Good. So, for example, for F, the solutions are J and beta R. Y and beta R is one set. Those are the standing waves. But notice they have the hats, right? Or HN1 and HN2 with the hats, which are the traveling wave solutions, right? Okay, so uh, what was I going to say about that? Oh, notice the dependence here, right? So that's one thing you want to be cognizant of. This solution, so in spherical coordinates, what do you want the field decay to be? Proportional to what? 1 over r, right? Because 1 over r squared is the product of E and H, if, if the fields are each 1 over r. And for power to be conserved in the spherical coordinate system, the surface area of a sphere grows proportional to r squared, 4 pi r squared. And the power, therefore, must decay proportional to 1 over r squared so that the power radiated remains constant in a lossless environment, right? Independent of distance. All right, good. But now we have to multiply those by r so we get this kind of dependence, right? Good. So you guys have seen all this before, which is good, all right? Now let's get into, is there any questions on that derivation? or the wave functions that we derived last semester. Do you remember all of them? No, okay, good. So these things are something that you have to use to, to, to get used to it, right? If you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. So it's probably because we haven't worked with these much. We did scattering off of the sphere last semester, right? So that's where we uh, used them most or used them before. But uh, this semester we're gonna use them not for scattering problems where we have a, sphere, a spherical object, a PEC sphere in, this, in the last semester example, and we illuminated it from outside with a plane wave and we scattered off of it and calculated the scattering, scattered fields and the RCS. This semester, we're going to illuminate it sort of from the inside. We're gonna have a hollow sphere. We're gonna use it as a resonator and we're gonna calculate what modes are supported by a spherical cavity, which is hollow and made of metal, all right? Okay, good. So. Consider the spherical cavity formed by a closed metallic hollow sphere of radius A. Yeah? I think that's not, that's spelled wrong, right? Should be an O or what? Okay. Okay, yeah. So you got to get them in and out, right? If you want to use this resonator. We're not talking about coupling to these modes yet. We're talking about what are supported by the spherical resonator. But normally you'd probably drill a little small hole and put a pin through it, right? So there's the sphere. Put a little pin through it and, and couple to them that way. Okay, so the cavity supports both TE2R and TM2R modes. To derive the TE2R modes, we use an electric vector potential F 
with only a Z component, right? Our electric vector potential F, no, not Z, R. R component. So if R has dependence on R theta and phi, and only an R component can in general be written, why do we choose these functions, right? In spherical coordinates, this is how you express a general solution. But why do we choose J and Y? They're not traveling waves. They're not traveling waves, right? Standing waves. Standing waves in R. What about these functions? What are these? This should be C2 as well. Some mistakes here. Uh, these are associated Legendre functions, right? These are the finite ones, and these are the singular ones, right? What, which one of these two is singular? One. Why? Very good. All right. And then these are just periodic in azimuth, right? But since they must be periodic, what do we know about M? They have to be integers. Very good. All right. So this is a general solution, right? Based on what type of wave functions we expect. All right. Since the fields must be finite at the origin, B1 must equal to zero because Yn is equal to infinity at R equal to zero. In particular, minus infinity. All right. Uh, what about the fields at theta equal to zero and theta equal to pi? Do you remember what the associated Legendre polynomials look like? Go back and look at those, right? Bounded, bounded at plus one and minus one, and they're bounded within a box of plus one and minus one in the y direction, right? Okay. Uh, if you're plotted them as y as a function of x, right? Okay. Uh, but what about the q's, right? The q's. Those ones go off to infinity, right? So they're not finite at theta equal to zero or theta equal to pi. Hence, D2 must be equal to zero. So let me clean this up. This should be an R, and this should be a 2. And we know that B is equal to zero, and D2 is equal to zero. So the fields, OK, so this is the expression for the uh, Electric vector potential for the spherical problem, right? Spherical coordinates. All right. We have those cosine mean signs. Yeah, we will. So what I what I want to uh, stress to you guys is the following. Whenever you see these functions, J n, beta r, p n m, cosine theta, it probably looks like something difficult to solve, or you don't get a good feeling about it, the intuition of what these look like, right? but it's just because you haven't worked at them. They're nothing but harmonic functions. In rectangular coordinates, the harmonic functions are what? Sine, cosine, exponentials, right? You've worked with those since middle school. So you know them very well, so they don't look scary at all, right? These are also harmonic functions, but they're in spherical coordinates. So they're harmonic with respect to R, right? They oscillate uh, somewhat sinusoidally. They have a decay, right? But they're harmonic functions. They're like... Uh, sort of oscillating functions in the radial direction. So all you have to do is think of these as harmonic functions, but, but you just have to go and uh, study their properties, right? Same as you did the trig functions when you first learned them. So don't be afraid of these. Just think of them as, as uh, sinusoids kind of things. How I think of it is that sinusoids are computed with a numerical table in the numerical infinite series. You're actually computing on a computer. Yeah. Um, it's sort of the same with the other things, but cosine and sine are just much more used, uh, sort of abstracted to an ideal case. Right? Exactly right. So, yes. Can you explain what the Legendre uh, functions are? Yeah, so the Legendre functions. So, last semester we solved the wave equation that we had, the Helmholtz homogeneous wave equation in spherical coordinates by separation of variables. And when you do that, the way that you solve uh, the way that you apply the separation of variables and pick out the separation constants and the differential equations that result from applying the separation of constants step by step. First, you separate the, the phi dependence because that one's independent and easy. Then you separate the uh, polar dependence. And what you get when you plug in the separation constant for the azimuthal dependence into the PDE, you get uh, Legendre's differential equation. And that one we had to solve. We solved last semester, right? We did the actual solution to it, the differential equation. And the way you solve it is through a series expansion. So you express 
the solution to the to the uh, it's an ODE at that point, right? You express a solution to the ODE in terms of theta, which is g of theta, in terms of the summation of uh, uh, expansion terms of uh, polynomials, right? Sum of over n of uh, a n times x to the n. And if you then plug in that that expansion to the uh, for g of theta into the differential equation, and you satisfy the equalities, and you match up indices and all that, then you get this expression at the end, which is in terms of an infinite series that that he was talking about. So that infinite series is the solution, but it's used so often in engineering that we give that series a special name. So we don't have to write down the series all the time. We can just say that series is PNM, right? So PNM is nothing but a function, which is a polynomial-like function that has a domain of plus one to minus one, but in spherical coordinates or polar coordinates, that plus one to minus one is the same as theta equal to zero to theta equal to pi. So over that range, there are okay, yeah polynomial functions. So over that range, there are uh, various polynomials, right? And they're all orthogonal. And uh, you can expand any polar function, right? So a function that has as a function of theta from zero to pi in terms of these polynomials. Okay, good. Yeah, so go back to last semester or or let me know if you weren't in the last semester's class. I can give you the notes for that. Okay, good. Uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up is notice now in this spherical coordinate system that everything is linked together, all of the separation constants, right? M, the azimuthal separation constant, is linked to the polar polar function, PNM, has two indices. So you cannot fix the azimuthal variation without affecting the polar variation. They're linked, right? Because Legendre's differential equation has both of those indices in it. All right. And then the polar variation, the polar separation constants are linked to the radial functions through Jn. So everything here is linked together, right? You affect one, if you fix one or you, you know, if, if sine of m5, if I choose m equal to two to get a particular azimuthal variation, then there has to be a particular effect on the polar variation and that that effect of the polar variation then can affect the what's that why does it affect j because j n is linked to p n m and m phi is linked to or cosine m phi is linked to p n m as well okay these two indices you can choose independently right n and m in the legendre so the azimuth the variation affects the polar but it doesn't affect the radio for, per se uh necessarily but then the radial is linked to the uh polar as well all right but those separation cons that are all linked together are going to affect what for us it will affect the modes right there's one other equation we get these wave functions at the end but they're all bound by what they're linked together in the end by by what no so when we derived this by separation of variables, we got these wave functions out, right? We separated into these different ODEs and we solved for these wave functions. But there was another equation that comes out of separation of variables. Yeah, the separation equation, right? So all these are linked together by the separation equation. And having all of these functions linked together like that, our separation equation is going to be very compact, right? So what is the subscript P? P for F R. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think P. Maybe that's a copy and paste. I'll have to look at it again. It'll be in the final expressions, so that's probably why it's appearing here. All right, <clears throat> p is going to be the num the zero number, right? Because we're going to end up applying boundary conditions on the spherical surface, which is to the radial function, right? It'll be in the r direction, so we'll have jn beta a, and then that function has to equal to zero, and there's going to be a p zeros of the Bessel function, right? The pth zero of the Bessel function defines mnp mode. All right, so uh, what was I going to say next? Okay, so that that's fr, right? Uh, all right, that's FR. So, oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Why do we not see 
Why is this called beta only? See if you can pick up on that. Why is there, why, why do I just call this beta? Because it's, it's spherical, so it... It's the what? So normally in cylindrical coordinates, when we had rho, the rho functions, we said beta rho rho, right? Why am I just calling this beta? It's related to something I just said about solving the wave equation by separation of variables. So let's go back to rectangular coordinates. When we solve the wave equation, what was the separation equation? Beta z squared equals to beta squared, right? Very good. Three separation constants. When we went to cylindrical coordinates, what was the separation relation? Independent. That's right. Beta z. Why? What happened to the third one? Sorry. Remember that the uh, cosine m phi in cylindrical coordinates was linked to jm beta rho rho, right? So one of the separation constants was actually linking the PDEs together. So we that doesn't appear here, right? It's not independent anymore. All right, so we lose one when we go when we add an angle. What is the difference between rectangular coordinates and then cylindrical coordinates? So look here. We have some function, let's say, x, y, z. What are all these? All these are lengths, right? Okay, let's go to cylindrical. What did we change? We introduced something, right? We, one of them is now an angle. And we lost a separation constant because it linked the PDEs. Now we go to spherical. What's the difference now? Two angles. One more angle. So now we have two angles in length, right? And we lost another separation constant. So beta r squared. Uh, if you want to put the squared, you don't have to because now it's just beta r squared is beta. So I don't have to differentiate these wave numbers as beta r, right? It's just beta. This, there's only one wave number now, right? Okay. So, so does it mean physically that only one wave can propagate in the, in the radial direction? Yeah, these are radial waves, right? If they're propagating. Everything else is not propagating. In, in rectangular coordinates, I can have a wave going in the x direction. I can have a wave going in the y direction and in the z direction. In cylindrical coordinates, so I got three wave numbers for those three waves. In cylindrical coordinates, I can have a wave going in radial direction, rho, and I can have a wave going in z. But phi is not a wave. It's a periodic function, right? So I have wave number, two wave numbers, radial and z. In spherical coordinates, I can only have waves going out in r. Everything else is, is, is a bound, is a standing wave or, or a periodic function, or right? it's a bound interval. So there's no wave... There's no radial, there's no wave number in the polar direction. They're indices instead, right? This has to be an integer, and these two indices here link the link the radial and the azimuthal variation. Okay. Good. Great. All right, now I should probably go a little faster. Okay, so since the associated Legendre function, I don't know if you remember, associated Legendre function, PNM, of some argument W, is related to the ordinary. Legendre polynomials, the associated Legendre function is related to Legendre polynomials through this expression, this derivative expression, right? So what does that imply? That means that if we have n equals to 0, then this index is 0. We have p0. If we plug it into our formula, we're going to differentiate p0. And uh, that's equal to 0, right? Because p0 is the constant. Whenever you have expansion set of functions, you typically have a constant. Okay, so let's say like Taylor series. You have a constant, then you have a linear, then you have a quadratic and a cubic and all of that you add, right? So you need the DC level. P0 is the, the constant, right? All right. Thus, uh, that means that N in PNM cannot be zero. Therefore, the index M, oh, sorry, the index N has to start from one. It cannot be zero. Clear? 
Okay, good. Um, also, since PN of W in general, the Legendre polynomial, the nth Legendre polynomial is an nth degree polynomial. Right? If you look at these Legendre polynomials, for, for example, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but P3 is going to be some coefficient times x cubed plus another coefficient times x. I, I don't know if there's a square. I think there's odd and even polynomials. I can't remember exactly. So even I have to go back and look them up, right? So just know, you want to know the properties of them, right? You, you don't need to memorize the definition of each polynomial. All right. Anyway, it's an n-degree polynomial. So if I have Pn here and I differentiate an n-degree polynomial, if I go to the nth plus one derivative, that's going to be zero, right? Because if you differentiate an n-degree polynomial n times, you get to a constant. All right, so that means Pn is equal to zero for m greater than n. All right, we're going to need these little facts later on. So we're going to calculate the fields from the potentials. As we said, we calculate, we calculate the potential, Fr. We've, we've now come up with a form for that, right? It's this one. And we're going to calculate E due to F from this expression, which is nothing but the expansion of the curl when it only has an R component. All right, then uh, H, we calculate by taking the curl of the curl of F, right? So you get these expressions. All right, so if we do that, we get a zero. Why do we get zero for ER? To E to R, very good. All right, E theta, we calculate, we get this expression. Here we have to differentiate our F with respect to phi. Our phi functions were the trigonometric functions. So we differentiate those, we pick up an M outside, and cosine become negative sine, and sine became cosine. E theta, we differentiate with respect to theta, but all we do here is we include this little prime, all right? And we'll deal with that later. Prime is going to be partial with respect to partial theta, all right? So don't, don't forget there's a prime there. All right, boundary conditions for the sphere. We have E theta and E phi are the tangential components in spherical coordinates to a surface area, a surface of PEC at R equal to A, that has to be zero. All right, so let's take our E theta and let's set it equal to zero when we evaluate it at uh, R equal to A, all right? So that expression has to be zero for all theta and all phi. And the only way that can happen is if this part is zero, right? So that means Jn beta A, and we're gonna call that beta resonant has to be equal to zero. And if you solve that, you get this radial wave number beta r, resonant wave number beta r, which is zeta np divided by a. Now here's that p index, and it just defines the zeros of the Bessel function. But this is not the zeros of the Bessel function that we studied in the last, uh, last lecture, last chapter. This is the zeros of the Bessel function hat, j n hat, right? The zeros of j n hat. Spherical, that's that scale by R. So there, are, we number them one, two, three, four, five, six, and this is the table of zeros of the spherical Bessel function J n hat. All right, good. You have less zeros. Uh, or, oh, that's a good question. Um, oh no, what's happening here is probably that whole field goes to zero because as n increases then uh, n has a finite range, right? Is that what it is? Let me think. That's a good observation. Uh, n ha cannot be zero. And for m greater than n, everything is zero. So for m greater than n, but this table is not a function of m. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. It's a good observation. There's a reason why probably. All right, good. But good observation. Okay, so beta r, omega r squared of mu epsilon, right, by definition, 2 pi f is omega, and that we said beta r is equal to this in order to satisfy the boundary condition for the fr that we chose. So we can rewrite this as this expression here. Uh, oh, here, this is the reason, right? So m has to be less than n. Why is there a negative sign there? That is incorrect. M has to be less than or equal to N, all right? 
Uh, but this table is not a function of M. So if I fix an M, then my N is limited. But the P's, that's a good question. Maybe they're just not listed because of the uh, difficulty of calculating them. I'll, I'll look into that. I'll let you know. I would expect there to be more than two zeros for n equal or three zeros for n equal to eight. Um, yeah, I would expect that. Okay, the resonant frequency of ten using the table are independent of m. All right. Thus, there are numerous degeneracies. Same resonant frequency among the modes, and we're going to study that uh, right now. So, for n equal to one and p equal to one, right? That's how you satisfy the zeros uh, or satisfy the uh, electric field E theta equal to zero. The N, N, P, N and P define the zeros at the Bessel function J hat, right? So this is how you pick the modes. N equal to one, P equal to one. And you can use all M up until that N, right? This is not minus. So if I pick N, then I, there's a finite number of M because the derivative of the Legendre, associated Legendre function, right? Or the associate, or sorry, the definition of the associated Legendre function equal to the derivative of proportional to the derivative of the Legendre polynomials. So that means there are a finite number of m, but this resonant frequency formula is independent of m. It only depends on n and p. So if I pick n and p, then all the m's that are allowed up until n are also at that same resonant frequency. So you get a bunch of degenerate modes. All right, degenerate modes meaning that they have the same resonant frequency. All right, so for n equal to one, p equal to one, the, uh, from the table you get 4.493, and we know that there are degenerate modes because m can go all the way up to n. n is equal to one, so uh, m equal to zero and one. I think it's m less than or equal, and that's why there's a minus sign there as a typo. Yeah, that is m less than or equal, sorry. Is there a way we can visualize like the degenerate modes? Is it like a rotation and like phi? Or... We'll do that today. I, I did all the simulations for you. So we're going to look at all of them. Okay, there's even and odd, right? Where is the even and odd coming from? Whether you, pick, whether you take the sine or the cosine, right? Because look here. E theta has sine and cosine. So we'll call one of them even and one of them odd. Cosine's even, sine is odd. So how many modes are there total? Well, we have the n equal to 1, p equal to 1, and then we have, it's M, N, P, right? N and P are fixed. So it's either 1, 1, 0 or 1, 1, 1 because M is allowed to go to 0 to 1 because M less than or equal to N is the condition. And uh, we have an even and an odd for, for these, right? So 1, 1, 1, even or 1, 1, 1, odd. We'll see that. Here, actually they're right here. Okay, so remember that for m greater than n, strictly greater, so m less than or equal to n is allowed, m equal to n, p n m e equals to zero. Thus, there are m equal to n degenerate modes, yeah? All right, the even and odd modes are used to represent cosine m phi and sine m phi variations. So there are three modes for p n equal to one, p equal to one. The next combination of this table is, say, uh, n equals to two, p equals to one. That's the next lowest order or the next mode that appears, right? The, the next highest number in this table. And for there, M is allowed to go 0, 1, 2. So we get eight modes at the same resonant frequency. All right, here's what they look like. So for the N equal to 1, P equal to 1, we have these three electric vector potentials. We have the 0, 1, 1, which is even. We have the 1, 1, 1 even and the 1, 1, 1 odd. All right? And here's the even part and the odd part of that. And what you'll notice is that, okay, so they're all equal to these expressions here. The even and odd functions are exactly the same up until the sine and cosine part. So even is just a 90 degree rotation of odd. All right. And this function itself, the 0, 1, 1 mode, is a 90 degree rotation in the theta direction instead of the phi direction with respect to these two modes. So the degenerates by rotation, yeah? All right, so these facts were used to calculate these expressions. All right, now the Tn to R modes, we can do the same thing with Tn to R, 
We have A instead of F now. The boundary condition is the same. We calculate E a little differently with a different formula. We evaluate that at A, and we have to differentiate with respect to R now, so we have a prime here, and with respect to theta, so we have a prime and theta as well. So J prime and P and M prime, all right? But still, this function has to go to zero, but now it's the prime of that function, so we have a prime in our zeta and P. So this table is the zeros of the derivative of J n prime, all right? Curious that it stopped in around 20. Yeah, maybe it's just how far they calculated it. No, I, uh, not sure. My feeling is probably not, but. <laughs> All right, so there's some the same degeneracy as the TE to R case. If you pick an N and a P, then now it's just the derivative, the zeros of the derivative of the Bessel function, and we get the same degeneracies. And here are three cases, right? All right. So let's look at an example. A spherical cavity of three centimeter radius and filled with air. Did, okay, so for a spherical cavity of a three centimeter radius and filled with air, determine the resonant frequencies in ascending order of the first 11 modes, including the degenerate modes, right? So how do we do that? We have this function for the TM to R, this function for the TE to R, all right? So the first three modes, mode one, mode two, mode three, we use the TM to R function. TM to R 0, 1, 1 mode is equal to the resonant frequency of the TM to R 1, 1, 1 even mode is equal to the resonant frequency of the TM to R 1, 1, 1 mode odd, all right? These three are all equal. All right, we can calculate that by finding what the uh, derivative is here, which is... Uh, no, here's the derivative table here, right? This is the derivative, the derivative table. So it's this value. So we plug that in there, and we know what 2 pi a times the square root of mu epsilon is. It is uh, 30 times 10 to the 9 over 2 pi times 3. So we get 4.376 gigahertz, or 367 gigahertz for the first three modes. They're all resonant at that same frequency. All three of them are in the cavity. All right? Modes 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all resonant at... 6.1593 gigahertz because the uh, 0 to 1 TM to R, the 1 to 1 TM to R even, 1 to 1 TM to R odd, the 2 to 1 TM to R even, and the 2 to 1 TM to R odd are all resonant at the same frequency. And that's only because this function here is not a function of M, and that means that for all M, this equation, for all M, so for so this is for for all m uh, less than or equal to n. That equation also sat, uh, applies to, right? Okay, good. And then nine, ten, and eleven. They asked us to calculate three more modes. Here's the te modes. So we have zero, one, 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 and one, one, one odd, and one, one even. Te to r. Yeah, resonant at 7.1508 gigahertz. All right, so uh, let's take a look at some simulations. Here are the CST results from what I simulated. Right? I did an eigenmode simulation in the CST Migrate Studio and for, a, for this same sphere made of air. has three centimeter radius. You draw of air. So you set the background material, the background medium material, the PEC, and then you just draw a vacuum sphere of radius three centimeter, and then you run the eigenmode solver. It's that easy. Okay, search for modes between four and eight gigahertz and give the first 11 modes. And this is what it returned here. And what do we see? We see the exact frequencies. What did we, what did we calculate? We calculated 4.3, 6.15, and 7.15. Here's 4.3, 6.15, and 7.15, and it even found all of the degenerate modes, right? There were three at this frequency, there were five at that frequency, and three at this frequency. So see, oh no. Oh, here we go, okay. So CST finds all the modes, right? So let's take a look at what these modes look like. We have, first off, this is the electric field in the bottom row, the magnetic field in the top row. This one here has, so what do we know about the electric field? in terms of the surface. 
That's PEC. E10 is zero. So this has to be normal everywhere, right? So there's no tangential components on the surface. So these contours are all normal, right? All right, that's one observation. This, this mode right here, this is probably the easiest one to study first. Let's look at this. So this is mode three in CST and also in our calculation, which is TM011 even mode, all right? Now remember, uh, this one has a circulating magnetic field. What, what plane is this? That's, that's a tough question to ask or to answer, right? So remember, these are what? TM to R modes. So what do we know about this magnetic field? Um, zero in the direction of R. No R component. So this is the vector field that you get with theta and phi components circulating, but there's no R component in it, right? This, this is the electric field part of it. And this one will have, in general, the remaining components, right? Or all components in general, I'd say. Okay, so, so these- this is the plane phi equal 90 degrees, for example. Uh, yeah, that could be phi equal to 90. Uh, what plane would this be? I, I think this is the XZ say? plane. There's a lot of symmetry here, right? It probably- It's, a, it's an angular one, because when we- Yeah, it has to be the XY plane, right? No. It's hard to imagine something without a radial component spherical coordinates. So it has to rotate uh, around the R. It has to rotate around the R, right? So the R axis must be coming out of the board in this cut, right? All right, so look at this. Here's the animations. It's a cavity. We know that E and H are 90 degrees out of phase, right? Because it's resonant, no loss, or, we, or a power flowing out. So. The electric field is maximum when the magnetic field goes to zero and vice versa, right? Is it, um, because it's a sphere, it's hard to imagine which direction it kind of pops in. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to look at sort of a 3D visualization. Uh, I think this one's mostly going into the board, right? It has to be because this one's mostly circulating within the board. Okay. Uh, you can go back to the field expression zone, you can visualize them. All right, here we have the, uh, these two modes are rotated 90 degrees with respect to each other in phi, right? Because this is the even and the odd mode, and this is the same mode, TM, or TM111 odd, TM11 even. They're rotated by 90 degrees with respect to phi, right? One's a sine mode, one's a cosine and phi mode. They're all degenerate, all three of these on this page have the same resonant frequency. And this one, remember, I said was rotated by 90 degrees in theta. Let's go back, right? Here. So there are three modes that we showed. And OK, there are three modes here. We have the FR or the, the uh, 0, 1, 1 mode even has cosine of theta. That one's rotated 90 degrees with respect to these two 111 modes because they're both sine of theta. Then we have the 111 even and the 111 odd are only 90 degree rotation from each other in terms of phi. All right, so now let's go to these again and you'll see 90 degrees with respect to phi even, 90 degrees with respect to phi odd, and this one's 90 degrees with respect to theta of these two. Okay, good. Yeah? Oh, so here's the cut plane. This is a cut plane at x equals to zero, which means it's the yz plane we're looking at. All right. Yz. Yeah, this is yz. So that means this is, say this is the y, this is the z. Then there's no radial component there, right? Radial component would be this way or that way. There's no radial component. The vectors are smaller when the radius is small and they get bigger when you're coming in. The center, you mean? When, when the center is small, when R is small, the vector is. Small. Why do you think that is? You mean it's, it's zero here and it's not, and it gets stronger as it goes that way, right? Why is that? Well, I guess that's not necessarily the reason, but. Remember, we excluded uh, y, ym, and we kept jm. 
J's are finite at the origin, but they don't necessarily have to be zero. So that's probably a bad conclusion. Ignore what I said. All right. Let's look at the next set of degenerate modes. All these are resonant at the same frequency, 6.15. All right. All right. They all, so I didn't take time to try to sift through these modes and find out which one is which, but you could probably do that, right? But here are all these modes, right? So we have mode four, which is one of these. We could probably, if we had more time, we could do it in class and find out which one is which. Uh, but, but these are all related by some kind of rotation. And if we look at these indices, we can probably figure it out, right? But all these modes exist at the same frequency. All right. And here are the uh, last three. So we have FR. These are all the TE modes. So now the electric field is rotating. The magnetic field goes in and out of the board, right? Okay. Let's do the quality factor really quick and we're done with this. We would derive the quality factor Q for one of the dominant modes, one of the dominant modes, because there are three, right, at the same frequency, TM011 mode. For this mode, the potential function reduces to this. Yeah? Why do you think, why do you think they may not, what do you think? The ones that are just rotated, yeah. So what, what matters? The tangential components on the walls, right? If the modes have different tangential components, then they would have a different Q. Uh, but if it's the same degenerate mode, they all have the same. Probably, if you just rotate it by 90 degrees, you don't change the tangential components, right? So I would probably say yes. Okay, here is the 0, 1, 1 mode, the magnetic vector potential. Calculate H. Why do we need to calculate H? Because... Okay, so since this mode, for this mode, the magnetic field only has one component, right? Whereas the electric field has two for this mode. So we will derive the Q factor from the magnetic field rather than the electric field. All right? So the magnetic field only has one component. It's H phi. Because this, for this mode, it's independent of phi. So when we differentiate with the phi, it goes away. All right? Because M is zero. All right. Now, at resonance, the total stored energy is twice the electric or twice the magnetic or equal to W total. That's two times mu over four. Remember, we used E and epsilon before, but now we're using H and mu times the magnitude of H squared. This is B dotted with H, right? All right. Then uh, that becomes this, but we're integrating in the volume, at, the volume of spherical coordinates. We plug in what H is. It has this J1 hat here. We know what this beta is because of the mode index, right? For the dominant one of that. And we have a sine theta here. And then we square this whole thing because it's h squared. So this becomes sine squared. And we had the original sine here, so we get sine cubed. All right? Everything else is constant. It comes out. We can do the phi and theta integration very easily. We get this. And now we're just left with this integration of a Bessel function squared spherical coordinates, sine cubed. All right, let's do that. So to calculate this, we use this formula, all right? Somebody's done it and they gave us the formula and this is the expression here. So it's J1 squared minus J naught times J2, all right? J1 squared times sine cubed, yeah, becomes this with that argument as well. So we know what we can look up the, the zero. So the zero, or sorry, J1 of 2.744, that's just evaluating the Bessel function at that, at that argument, 1.06. J0 at 2.744, 0 0.3. J2, 0 0.7738. If you include all those, you get this expression. We're going to divide and multiply by 2.744, which is the beta R. And then we can write it like this. We'll do that for convenience later on. So thus we have the total electric energy stored is this expression. And you'll see why we wrote it like that. Now we have to find, remember what Q is, omega times W divided by P loss, right? P dissipated. So we need to calculate P dissipated now. And uh, we're going to do the, you know, I squared R, which is integral of J squared into R over 2, 1 half I squared R, J times J conjugate. Well, we know what H, H is, make, to make the magnitude squared, 
evaluate this at at the surface of the PEC surface to calculate the current there. And this now is not a function of uh, R anymore, so this Bessel function comes out. We just have to integrate sine cube d theta d phi. That's easy to do. We get this value uh, here, I believe. No, that's the Bessel argument. Uh, looks like we're going to get this. Uh, I would expect there to be something else due to the sine cubed. Uh, okay. Well, in the end, we get this expression by... Uh, oh, by evaluating this, right? Because J1... No, it's a J1 squared. So here's J1, 1.06 squared gives you 1.132. Okay, so now we have that. We can take Q, omega divide, uh, times W over P dissipated, and what do we get? If you take those two expressions we just derived and divide them, then we get 1.0048 over RS, all right? What we're gonna do now is compare what the uh, comparable resonators. So we have a spherical resonator of a radius R, which is, and then we have a cubical resonator, which has length, width, and height, and we have a cylindrical resonator, all made of PEC. We studied all these already, right? And we're going to compare them all. But the cavities are, are the geometry of the cavities are such that they're all circumscribing the cubical cavity. Circumscribing means it just fits inside, right? Okay. So here's the spherical cavity of radius A. They're all in their dominant modes. Here is the cylindrical cavity of diameter D and H equal to D operating in the dominant mode. We get this expression. And the rectangular cavity of cubical shape, uh, with this mode, the dominant mode, we get this expression, all right? We derived all these in our lectures. If we divide them to ratio them, we find that the Q of the spherical cavity, and you want, whenever you define or design a cavity and you design a resonator, you want it to have a super high Q, right? You want it to be single monochromatic. You want it to be very uh, sharp, single frequency type of thing, right? So you want a higher Q, less loss as well. So, uh, the Q of the spherical cavity is 25% greater than the circular cavity and 35% greater than the cubical cavity. And one way you can think of that is that, remember, the Q is proportional to volume and inversely proportional to surface area. And what geometry, here's a table of these, what geometry has the greatest surface area to volume ratio? Or volume to surface area? Yes, the sphere, right? Oh, Those are not Q factors, okay? This is from Wikipedia. This is the graph of the area on the vertical axis versus the volume on the horizontal axis for a bunch of different solids, like a cube, a pyramid, or and then all of these other icosahedrons and so forth. But the sphere has the greatest proportion of volume to surface area. That's why the Q is the greatest. So if you want to build a very high quality resonator, you want to use a spherical cavity, right? Was the conclusion. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. So uh, 